I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar on mobile brain imaging with FNIRS. I'm delighted to welcome today's speaker, Dr. Alexander von Luhmann, and I'll give Alex a proper full introduction in just a moment, but first I do have a few other things to cover. We are NIRX. For over 20 years at NIRX, we have designed and manufactured innovative NIRX devices and software. We integrate devices, software, and more into user-friendly and powerful research solutions. Our team of scientific consultants focuses on providing you and your team with training and outstanding support so you can focus on your research. This webinar is one example. Our FNIR solutions are invented, designed, and manufactured in Berlin, Germany, distributed by a network of excellent local distributors worldwide and supported by an international team of scientists in Europe and North America like myself and colleagues in this webinar. I am Thomas Johansson, Ashlyn Casey, Eric Nelson, and a host of other people are all working to make this webinar go smoothly. Um, I introduce Ashlyn and Eric as uh, co-organizers, just helping some of the mechanics. So some considerations that I'd like to cover. You are muted. Questions are very much welcomed at any time. You'd use your GoToWebinar panel to do that. And Ashling and Eric will be taking those uh, questions, organizing them, and we'll be able to go over those at the end. Content will be available on our website in the upcoming days as this is being recorded. If you have any further questions, please do email us at consulting at nearx.net. Now, back to Alex. Dr. Von Luhmann is a senior research and development scientist at Nearx. He received his PhD with distinction in 2018 from Berlin Institute of Technology and his MS and BS degrees in electrical engineering from Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, KIT. Sorry if the pronunciation is terrible, Alex. You can correct me if need be. Uh, and, and that was in 2014 and 2011. In his PhD work at Technical University of Berlin with his advisor, Professor Klaus Robert Mueller, he designed hybrid wearable functional near infrared spectroscopy and electroencephalography systems and machine learning based analysis approaches as well. He recently joined NEREX after completing his postdoc at Boston University's Neurophotonic Center with Professor David Boas. His research is focused on multimodal diffuse optical instruments and multimodal signal processing towards neurotechnology applications outside of the lab and in the everyday world. In today's webinar, Dr. Von Luhmann will cover an overview of portable and wearable FNIRS mobile brain imaging related to the research he has done, including multimodal approaches in research to mobile brain imaging, understanding and dealing with motion artifacts, analysis considerations, and we'll also get to see a live demonstration of mobile FNIRS. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to Alex. Yeah, hello and thank you. Let me see that I share my screen properly here. Um, so far, I don't get the invite here. There you go. OK. Um, just a second, and here we are. Um, thank you for the introduction, Thomas. I'm very happy to talk about, uh, well, a lot of things today, um, but they all fall under the umbrella of mobile brain imaging with, uh, with FNIRS. But before I want to get started, uh, I would like to um, give a like do a brief round to mention the labs and colleagues that were crucial for all the work that uh, we'll cover here in this webinar, and uh, the topics that I'm going to talk about are the results of uh, organic continuous efforts and collaborations across multiple labs throughout the last years. Um, among them, as Thomas uh, mentioned, is the machine learning lab in the Berlin Brain Computer Interface Group at Tier Berlin, where I did my PhD under Professor Müller and Professor Blankertz. Um, I was then very lucky to collaborate with uh, the German Institute for Metrology uh, to validate the FNIRS-based instrumentation that I designed at the Tier Berlin. And in 2017, um, Professor Tulay Adali welcomed me for a brief research visit to a machine learning for signal processing lab at UMBC in Baltimore. Um, that is also where we continued some of our, our signal processing efforts that I will briefly talk about um, later in this talk. And lastly, as Thomas also mentioned, um, during my postdoc, I worked very closely with David Boas and his group in Boston, which was uh, a real pleasure. And we um, tackled a lot of uh, interesting issues and also developed a, a vision that I would like to talk about in the very um, end of this, of this uh, presentation. 
So um, <clears throat> briefly, to give you an idea of the structure of this talk, um, first of all, I will do uh, two little different motivations of why would we actually want to do mobile brain imaging with FNIRS. I'm going to briefly uh, touch on uh, two of uh, a few instruments that I was involved in that, that include FNIRS technology and will use um, one specific instrument that we, uh, we used for a study, uh, a mobile yeah, FNIRS EEG study, or we'll use that study and the data from that study to basically kick off and motivate and exemplify um, some of the effects of motion and how we can try to tackle them in the main part of this webinar, which is, is this third part that will discuss the physio physiology in FNIRS, but also the signal processing uh, approaches that we came up with to get a bit closer to solving this very, very challenging problem. And then after that, uh, we'll switch to the live demo um, that uh, the team here at NIREX has prepared. Um, uh, I will talk, say a bit more about that before we do a, a live switch in-house. I think it's the first time we do it like that, so it's uh, quite um, exciting. And then um, afterwards, um, Dr. Um, Robert Franke will give us uh, a brief intro uh, on the accelerometer that the, the system that we'll demo, the Neosport 2, uh, provides. Uh, he's the, um, the team lead in our software depart department here and knows best about that, that piece of equipment and the data uh, that comes out of it. And then in the end, I will return to the big vision, basically one of the potential um, applications or you know the pathways to go for mobile brain imaging. So I'd like to start with uh, the motivation with this famous painting by Rembrandt. Um, for the gentleman in this famous painting, the subject of investigation is a dead body and its anatomy. And um, in that time, relating the observations of a person's behavior during his lifetime or her lifetime to the anatomy and physiology uh, after their death enables inference about the about how the body works, how the brain works. And um, on the other side here, uh, one person that was very famous for his great cognitive achievements already during his lifetime was Gauss. And so it's not really surprising that scientists are really curious to learn about his brain um, which they did right after his death in 1855. Um, he served science one last time in another anatomy lesson when his brain was meticulously investigated. And so um, this is, you know, the first kind of motivation is how we have developed our um, approach of doing brain science in the last centuries. Uh, in the 19th century, this uh, approach uh, led to um, a real a sketch uh, of Gauss's brain, and it was compared to that of a Brain of a, uh, the brain of a German farm worker. So these are sketches from a book uh, that I got on the flea market. The book is from 1879. Um, and uh, here it was concluded that by comparing those brains that the brain works like a muscle. The more you work with it, the more convolutions and mass it gets. And now we all know that in the 20th century, we have seen an, an incredible uh, increase in rapidly developing neuroimaging technologies, uh, amongst them fMRI and also FNIRS. And uh, so far, um, which is slowly changing, but the conventional way of looking at the brain, which is now looking at the brain of a living human, um, um, is still under comparatively constrained but well-controlled experimental conditions. Now, outside of brain research with Fitbits and, and all those miniaturized um, uh, technologies that are coming up, we can also see a trend that there is definitely the, uh, the approach to get new technology out of the lab and into the everyday world, into um, consumer products maybe even eventually, but um, in this kind of motivation, um, you know, we can say that if Gauss was living today, wouldn't it be nice if we could look into his brain, if we could do some brain imaging while he was thinking about uh, um, genius ideas while taking a stroll in the park. Um, and for that, we need to tackle a lot of challenges that I will briefly come back to. A different way of looking at uh, how to motivate this is um, uh, connected to the vision that we developed at Boston University, um, and, and I want to put it into words like this. Uh, we, um, we know that contemporary neuroscience provides us with uh, great insights into the functioning of the brain already, but uh, we still have a lot to understand. There's a big gap in our understanding of healthy and impaired brain function. And one of the possible reasons for that, uh, amongst many other reasons, is that while we uh, have some understanding of how the brain works uh, in single snapshot experiments under restricted lab settings, we don't really know how the brain works in complex, dynamic, and multisensory real-world environments. So in the interaction with another human being and the interaction with the, uh, with the environment. And there's great approaches already on the horizon that tackle this problem. 
by involving virtual reality, augmented reality into experimental paradigms, um, but also by uh, successfully, you know, continuously slowly moving um, into the real world um, and into uh, non-simulated environments. So, of course, this is uh, an immensely complex problem um, that is out of the question. And uh, in this talk now, in this webinar, I will, I will focus a bit on uh, some of the approaches that, that me and the people that I work with uh, in, the, in the last years, um, we have kind of our way of tackling this. Um, so I want to give a broad overview of, um, of that. Just very briefly, we can skip over this because I assume that everybody in this webinar right now will roughly know what functional near infrared spectroscopy is. But just to remind us, we use near infrared light to interrogate the tissue. Um, near infrared light um, in a certain wavelength uh, can penetrate the skull pretty deeply, and uh, we can measure markers of neurometabolic activity um, with this technique. Um, the signal is comparatively weak, so the instrumentation has to um, be sensitive and, and um, sophisticated, and we, uh, we can achieve quite a good spatial resolution, and the temporal resolution is due to the slow physiological response um, okay. So EEG, for example, would be faster. There's trade-offs in everything, but um, uh, the uh, FNIRS especially um, provides several advantages, and uh, now I want to briefly cover um, uh, some of the challenges that we think uh, one should tackle to, uh, to move successfully in the long run out of the lab. Um, we know that we have to decrease the acquisition constraints in our experiments. The systems have to have a good usability. We need to be able to you know, do the whole thing without, uh, without the experimenting breaking. Um, we need to um, achieve robustness. So the signals that we measure, we want to, uh, we want to be able to rely on them. Um, and uh, we uh, want to uh, measure more information about the environment, but also about, uh, about the body that we observe. So uh, in this triangle here, the, the, on the top of the pillars here is the multimodal instrumentation. Multimodal can mean anything under this umbrella term, basically, that um, uh, extends just one measurement. Um, let's say even if you go high density, uh, you could consider this multimodal if you uh, use short separation channels, something we will briefly touch upon later. But multimodal instrumentation has to be built so that we can do mobile measurements. Um, and the, these efforts are ongoing, uh, both in academia and also in uh, here in, in industry. Those, uh, those enable us then to do novel experiments uh, that yield ex experimental data sets of, uh, that, that has a plethora of information that we can work with. And with that, that data, we can develop good new novel signal processing methods um, using machine learning or, or not, but um, to exploit all the information that we measure from the brain and the body um, to uh, get more robust against non-stationarities and artifacts and everything that uh, well, makes our life difficult. Um, just briefly, we'll not cover EEG in this talk so much, um, but um, I usually would say at this time that uh, EEG and FNIRS integration is a very good combination to, to tackle this multimodal, uh, multimodality setup, and that is because EEG and FNIRS are very similar in their complexity and in their uh, safe, safety and in their miniaturizability and wirelessness and so on and so forth. So I just want to briefly point out to two webinars, um, two of them passed, and then there's an, one that is very, um, that's uh, next week, so just in a week, um, webinars that deal with the uh, analysis uh, or the data integration of EG and FNIRS. Um, those webinars you can find on uh, our NERIX.net website. Um, they, they are recorded, so you can watch them um, also now that they are already, that they take, took place. Um, so this is just the motivation. I know this was a long motivation, um, but um, I will try to um, get to our main point of interest very, very soon. Uh, I want to briefly give a brief overview of, of one of the, um, the aspects or the ways that we looked in the past into uh, what instrumentation is kind of worthwhile developing, uh, putting out there uh, and moving forward. And so what I'm going to give you now is just a very brief overview of, of a, um, an aspect of many different ways of developing instruments. First of all, the, these instruments are all fiberless, and, um, and for research purposes, at least, uh, we, we understood always that it is good to have a scalability mod modularity or um, customizability in whatever way um, to enable any research needs. Uh, um, then uh, open source aspects in, in, uh, in some of the instruments and uh, multimodality uh, to increase a higher robustness. So there's a, a review that is actually by now, it's already three years old, but uh, I think it's still, still worthwhile that, that looks into different systems that have, been, that have come up in academia in the past. I will just briefly 
show you this kind of evolution um, and we'll pick two instruments um, uh, that, that we'll briefly talk about. Um, one of my first projects um, was the Open News project. Uh, we'll not go into detail here, but the idea there was to combine modularity and open source to boost uh, anybody's uh, abilities to just build their own system from scratch. On top of that, uh, in, during the PhD uh, that I did at TU Berlin, um, I developed a, uh, a hybrid EEG FNIRS instrument called M3BA. I will briefly come back to this to uh, motivate the data um, acquisition and the experiment and then the data processing that we'll, we'll look into. And then uh, in the last year and uh, beginning of this year, I was involved in the Ninja NIRS or the Open FNIRS project from uh, David Boros' group uh, at Neurophotonics Center, Boston University. Very, very exciting project. That is basically the next generation open source FNIRS. Um, and lastly, the new concept that I will come back to when we talk about the vision. So just briefly, the Ninja NIRS um, uh, is a system that is um, on the uh, openfnews.org website. It's an open source system that is also supposed to be scalable. Um, if we talk about what different systems or products you could say offer us, this is on the academic side, um, certainly uh, uh, an ongoing effort to, to push the limits. Um, the idea is uh, to have a, a digital front end that, that uh, is being controlled by one control unit um, and the digital front end includes emitters and detectors, um, both uh, with uh, the ADC and, uh, and um, yeah, well, anything that, that is needed to just then communicate digitally. Um, this, uh, this project is ongoing and in, uh, in David's lab is, I think, kind of taking up speed more and more and is currently at the state where uh, Antonio, who's a PhD student there, um, is doing first rides uh, with his bike wearing uh, an eight-channel system. Um, and that is uh, one basically way uh, you know, of looking into, okay, how can we bring this out of the lab, the nurse technology and the brain machine. So this is one of the aspects uh, of looking at this. And we'll add some more aspects here also later in the demo and a different uh, way of doing this. Um, I briefly want to just add this other um, uh, instrument that is the M3BA. Instrumentation is not so important in this talk, but the M3BA is, uh, just to summarize it, is a module that combines EEG, FNIRS, and additional physiological measurements into a small standalone, mod a standalone module. Why do I mention it here at all? Um, the specs are actually not so important, even so I want to skip briefly through, just show you that it you know, fulfills the normal specs for you know, high quality EEG and FNIRS instrumentation so that the data that we measured you know, was validated together with the metrology, uh, the German Institute of Metrology, for example. Um, so that this system, this architecture that uh, I designed in, the, uh, in my PhD thesis, uh, that there was kind of, um, it, it opened several doors in terms of doing novel experiments and getting the data that then we used to, uh, to develop the methods I'm going to talk about now. Just briefly, uh, this is built on top of the open NIRS, so uh, it is not open source, it's actually patented, but the, um, the uh, core features in there are all, you know, um, kind of grew from the open NIRS um, project. So um, you will ex understand in a second why I, um, why I actually just showed the M3BA right now, because we use this in a headset that I now want to briefly, uh, well, not the headset, I want to briefly explain and show you the, the experiment that we did um, that um, was um, that can be seen in the domain of BCI neuroergonomics. BCI neuroergonomics uh, uses neurophysiological neuro markers to assess mental or emotional states um, to uh, to create a supportive environment for a human operator. We uh, focused on the aspect of mental workload here. Um, I'm not going to define this so much. It's not so important here. Uh, you know what the actual experiment was about. The, the thing that is more important was that um, we wanted to access, uh, assess mental workload with FNIS and EG in completely freely moving subjects under yet controlled conditions. And so that is where the M3BA ended up in a kind of custom tailored headgear. This is you know, all prototypical, um, which is also not so important. Important is now that you will see this headgear on the head of one of our participants. I'm gonna show you a brief video. And now uh, the experiment that we're gonna watch now um, is going to be Provide, it will provide us the data that we'll, that we'll use to understand um, more uh, about what is actually going on in the data. So what you see here is now a geometrical uh, circular setup in which uh, the participant has to press buttons. This is based on a modified spatial n back task. I'm not going to explain so much now what is going on here. What is only important is that you can see that to do his task, which is a mental task, the participant has to move to go back and forth to see the whole, have the full uh, view of this, uh, the setup 
press buttons, uh, so he has to move. But when he does that, we know exactly roughly where uh, and how his body was positioned also because the whole setup is customized to uh, the, the, the wingspan and the, the, um, the height of the participant. So in this experiment, what we uh, acquired simultaneously with these M3BAs was uh, EEG and FNIRS, and now I'm going to focus on N2 FNIRS, but also accelerometer um, um, that was rigidly coupled to the head, and EMG and ECG and, and, and a lot of other things that are not really relevant right now. We looked into frontal FNIRS, and uh, aside from, so this is all raw, unfiltered data, or, or very, very slightly pre-processed only, um, we see uh, in the EMG, we have some neck activity that you know also goes into the EG, but it's not so important here. What is much more interesting is that we see for a certain time press event, which is here when you see an H and a, uh, a vertical uh, line, a hit um, stands for a button press event, uh, which was time locked um, and synchronized to the data. And, uh, and the three here is, is basically telling us the position of where the button was at the wall. So what we can see is that for every, uh, the S is the start of a trial, for every hit, for every button press, which corresponds to a certain body position, we see a modulation in the FNIS signal. The, the optodes were rigidly coupled, so this is not optode shift, but this is a uh, slow modulation. And we can see how this corresponds somehow to changes in the accelerometer signal that we acquired simultaneously. So now the question was, what can we do um, in this setup, um, if we don't do anything, we won't be able to do anything useful with this near signal, right? Um, because there's basically modulation all the time, and it is in a in a frequency band that is uh, is similar as in our trials, and also in the same frequency band as our um, as our HRF. So uh, simple averaging won't do the trick. So the question was then, what can we do about these kind of slower motion artifacts? And so this is what I want to talk about now and spend some time uh, before we go to the demo. Um, the uh, effects of motion and specifically uh, the, uh, the effects of motion that uh, we don't already all know, and that is the optode shift. And there's, it is still sometimes tricky enough, but there's a lot of methods out there to tackle this, um, to spline interpolate or, or uh, you know, Savitsky could live filter the data. Uh, many, many ways have been devised that work sufficiently well to, um, to correct um, single motion artifacts from optode shifts. But what do we do about changes in physiology that are due to motion? And so uh, for, for that, um, to give some more background and to let's, let's deep dive into this now, um, I want to uh, talk a bit about the physiological, physiological components in FNIR. So probably many here um, in the attendees uh, will have seen this figure in one or another way. It just explains how when a stimulus uh, reaches the brain, neural activity, neural activity leads to uh, a process that's called neurometabolic coupling and a process that is called neurovascular coupling. And in, a, in an antagonistic way, somehow, you know, they up and down regulate um, uh, so that we see an overall increase of uh, oxyhemoglobin locally and a, an overall decrease in deoxyhemoglobin uh, local, locally in the tissue that has been um, activated. But this hemodynamic response is obviously not something that we just measure directly in our FNIS channels, um, which is the unfortunate part here. Like in the EG, we have all those other artifacts, and EG is all electrophysiological. In NIRS, it's pretty different, um, but not, not less of an issue. And uh, so this, this figure shows, you know, basically all the things and more that, that can, uh, can um, influence and, and um, add to what we actually measure in the long separation FNIS uh, signal that we, that we measure. Um, we have, the, in this case, representative brain activity. Accelerometer will have some effects. For example, uh, that you, you can see an optode shift. You will see how this correlates to accelerometer data. Um, but also um, other variables play a role in how the long separation FNIS signal that we observe is being modulated aside from just the brain activation. That can be respiration, that can be blood pressure changes, systemic SCO2, uh, and uh, superficial perfusion is very, um, very important and is also, I think, um, now um, generally acknowledged that this has to be actually taken care of in, in every measurement that, uh, if it's possible. So um, the message here is just uh, functional near infrared spectroscopy signals contain much more than just the HRF and much more than just the heartbeat, for example. And uh, so what do we do? <laughs> um, so I briefly want to mention here again that um, I'm not going to talk about motion shift, uh, optode shift, um, artifact, uh, artifact correction methods 
there have been two webinars here that, that you can access by uh, Dr. Huppert and Dr. Uchel. Um, they talk about various um, approaches that are available in the toolboxes, uh, Home of Free and the NEARS toolbox. Miriam also talked about um, some of the uh, aspects that I will kind of repeat here um, in this context that I'm kind of building right now. So um, to better understand the approach that we took here, to, to uh, better understand what the FNU signal is actually made of and how we can maybe decompose it into, back into its components, uh, I want to briefly introduce this uh, very, very general model that is well known across disciplines, um, especially also in EG is, is one of the standard models, but also in FNIRS, and that's the linear mixing model. Um, there is a very well known example uh, in the cocktail party problem for ICA. We have a room full of people that talk. We have uh, at least the same number of um, of microphones uh, that that uh, that um, record uh, the, the, the audio. And the question is, can we figure out, can we unmix our recordings where everything is overlaid and, and reconstruct the single speaker? And now in EG, that might be uh, a neuroelectrical unit uh, that is speaking, and in FNIRS, it might be basically our localized um, uh, tissue sample that we want to interrogate. In the math mathematical notation, we just denote the speakers or the sources as S and the observed data as X, and uh, our weights that um, combine both um, we, we we call as A, and so this would be uh, an, depending on the on the field you're in in EG and in BCI, this would be uh, the the pattern that uh, links, um, or for example, lead field matrix that links the the source activity to our observed data. And in FNIRS, you can apply the same uh, theoretical model. And what we're usually interested though in is, is estimating the sources, right? We want to know which source is brain, which source is something else uh, like heartbeat or, or blood pressure change. And so uh, then you would look for, uh, simultaneously look for the source, which you don't know, and the filter, the spatial filter from our measured data to get back to the source space. So um, there's many, many um, approaches to do this. There's unsupervised and supervised approaches. What I want to just briefly do here is again, you know, basically uh, get us into the mindset of how we can look at FNIRS data, and that is, um, we um, we decompose um, our observed channels by using all the data that we have, all channels in parallel, and try to get to this one thing that interests us, which is the HRF. But uh, why not try to do this via the source space by decomposing with blind source separation methods, for example, decomposing the signals into various components like the uh, component for heartbeat, uh, also motion, and uh, and remove those and then get a much cleaner signal. So um, this is something that in uh, in one of the, in the, it's kind of one of the first frameworks that, that we designed and published in the last year in, in NeuroImage that is dealing just with the blind source separation of, of FNIR signals. Um, I want to briefly now uh, go a bit into that, uh, just to tell what we looked out for, what is, what is, Kind of problematic and what partial solutions at least we found. In general, um, FNIR signals um, are challenging to decompose for a variety of reasons. Um, first of all, we have in one single channel, long channel, we have a mix of speci special specific, which is localized signals and also systemic contributors um, or artifacts. Um, we have coupling that is non-instantaneous, non-constant and often non-linear between the sources, but also between various channels which makes it incredibly hard. In EEG, for example, we can assume that everything is measured instantaneously. Um, uh, physiological noise is colored. Um, so there's sample dependency that, uh, that might make it more difficult for us to decompose, for example, with an ICA algorithm. And there is potentially dependency between sources, which is also making it a bit harder when you actually do uh, independent component analysis. So now just briefly, there's two papers, uh, one that recently came out and one that is a bit older already from 2016 that play here, play into this. Uh, Ted Huppert uh, did uh, and much more, but he, he brought this uh, this nice commentary on statistical, statistical properties of, F, of noise in FNIRS. And this is a very recent uh, paper from the ETH Zurich group that um, looks a bit more into how uh, scalp um, um, hemodynamics are heterogeneous. And so one single short separation um, channel might not cover it all. Um, so those things all, you know, relate to these challenges um, in, in various ways. And uh, I want to now present briefly kind of the core unit of the approaches that we have done in the, in the past years for both blind source separation, but also for an improved general linear model. And that is uh, based on temporarily canonical, temporarily embedded canonical correlation analysis. 
or TCCA. What you see here now, we go back to the data from our experiment, is um, a low-pass filtered segment of two channels uh, in the intensity domains. So we have 750, 850 nanometers uh, over 35 seconds. And if I add the um, times that we tracked whenever a button was pressed, and we know there was a certain body position um, that, that the, the participant took, uh, we can already guess that these dips here, they are related to motion, right? Um, what becomes very nicely evident, though, is when we add the accelerometer signal that we simultaneously acquired, we can see that there's some relation, there's some correlation, some interrelation. And uh, what we can also see, though, and that makes our life a bit hard, is now that when there's the dip of our first principal component of the accelerometer signals, this first dip, well, there's a delay between the actual movement and the change in the FNS signal, slow change. Unfortunately, that delay is not constant. So if we go to this other motion here, this 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 movement, we see that that delay uh, between the peak of the accelerometer signal and the different channels is completely different. So what do we do? <laughs> and uh, this is where TCCA comes into play. First of all, um, the analysis and the decomposition of multivariate data, for example, using accelerometer and FNIRS, but it can be anything else. Uh, for this canonical correlation analysis is kind of well known. And to tackle this non-instantaneous coupling now, what we can do is we can temporarily embed uh, one of our signal domains, which means basically and simply adding time-shifted copies of uh, the, uh, the the signal and do performing a, comp uh, a temporarily com sorry a temporarily embedded con canonical correlation analysis on this embedded signal and the original signal. What we'll get then is we'll we'll cover. Uh, we, we will much be able uh, to much better cover um, and, and model these shifts, um, and that is what, what TCCA adds here. Now, I want to briefly tell you one way of, in, of using TCCA in, uh, in this first approach that is uh, dealing with unsupervised analysis. So for the non-machine learners here, unsupervised means just we do not have labels. We don't know the ground truth, basically, where we want to decompose uh, the signals with some um, with some assumptions that we take, that we make, and uh, Blizzard is what we is the acronym here is uh, is a blind source separation framework that combines a lot of blind source separation methods, um, trying to tackle uh, the the challenges or at least a subset of the challenges that I mentioned before. So we will do PCA to reduce accelerometer signals. This is kind of the most trivial one. Uh, ICA to um, decompose FNIR signals and TCCA to uh, to decompose FNIR and accelerometer signals. Also, we use FNIRS and accelerometer in this framework, which is not limited to this application. ICA of FNIRS signals is challenging. Um, so as I just said, one of the blocks in Blizzard is ICA of FNIRS signals. Uh, there is, uh, there's, ICA has been um, used on, uh, on FNIRS signals in various ways um, uh, and quite a lot, uh, but it's not really frequently used for various reasons. And one of the reasons is that typically it underperforms PCA. And it also depends how in what context it is being applied. But um, one of the conclusions here by Vitanen, for example, in 2009, was that it underperforms usually. But the reason is that uh, the, the methods that are typically used, um, like the Infomax, the fast ICA, they assume um, uh, IID and non gaussianity uh, which basically means they only exploit higher order statistics, um, but um, that makes it harder to, to um, do the decomp decompose a signal that, that has so many challenging characteristics. So when I was at UMBC with Thula Adali, we used one of their uh, novel uh, ICA algorithms, which is called entropy rate bound minimization. That also takes into, in, into account sample dependence and um, in this assumption of uh, independence and can therefore also mul uh, model multiple Gaussian sources and even can deal with source dependencies in a better way. What you see here is a toy data example. Um, this is our true sources. We mix them with a known mixing matrix. We do fast ICA decomposition and we do ERBM decomposition. And what these signals stand for are basically our typical physiological nuisance signals like uh, the, the heartbeat. Uh, no, sorry, this is, um, the, the, I think, the, okay, one of them is, is breathing. The other one is heartbeat, which is modulated by breathing. We'll have uh, motion artifacts. We have Gaussian noise. And so, uh, you know, we, you can see that fast ICA in this case um, does not perform so well, whereas ERBM actually performs pretty well. This, of course, works also for real signals. And uh, so now again, we look at data from the experiment that I showed before, the uh, horizontal lines of button press events, which is where the motion artifacts occur. And we can see that if we decompose the FNIR signals, the raw intensity FNIR signals with ERBM, we get some sources that 
are quite nicely modeling. It doesn't always work that nicely, of course, but they, they're modeling uh, the heartbeat here. We have slow oscillations, mayo wave oscillations probably, and we have a few sources that um, um, at least um, by the most of the ex uh, by most extents um, models the, the artifacts. So just a brief overview, um, because otherwise this also goes too deep. The Blizzard framework now consists of uh, FNIRs uh, and accelerometer signals. FNIRs signals are being ICA decomposed. Accelerometer signals are uh, orthogonalized and temporally embedded. Then we do canonical correlation analysis to estimate artifactual components in the FNIR signal. We subtract those from the original data and we get a clean signal. Um, that is the theory and it works also in practice uh, more or less well. So if I show you one of the result, um, results here is um, again experimental data, low pass filtered um, and what we have is the original and the clean data. You can see a high, um, high modulation during the, the, uh, the button press events and uh, what we actually, I mean that we did a lot of other things but this is the, you know, these two examples are very I think, easy to, to uh, see. We also looked into the average artifact across trials. At, uh, um, uh, so we looked at the average artifact across participants, but also across um, um, uh, channels for a certain um, um, uh, position here and for all the positions. And we can see that um, the average artifact that is induced, the motion artifact, which is physiological motion artifact that is induced, uh, we can reject uh, by almost two orders of magnitude um, in the signal by uh, just doing blind source separation in this framework. So um, uh, this I basically want to skip, but this was uh, this enabled us in the first place to do a proper classification despite rejection of a lot of physiological noise and artifacts um, of uh, EEG and FNIRs to get to our work mental workload in the uh, experiment that I briefly showed. Um, the results here just are supposed to say that um, when you compare the results that we were able to achieve under these very challenging conditions and by really radically cutting away uh, signals that would have been classified, but they were, would have been artifacts, we achieved a very similar performance, which was pretty um, satisfying. So now I want to go uh, and tackle the second part um, of the, uh, the signal processing, uh, and that is the supervised um, approach to uh, improve um, our robustness against motion-induced artifacts. And that is uh, the GLM with TCCA. So what I'm assuming here is that um, in, uh, in this FNIRS community, most people will know what the general linear model is. We'll briefly go over this. And we extended that and tried to provide more optimal nuisance regressors than the uh, short separation channels that are currently being used, which is already very important. And we tried to optimize that by um, by using more information, um, accelerometer, source separa uh, short separation, but also other uh, physiological um, modalities to get a better uh, nuisance regressors and therefore um, also esti a better estimate of our hemodynamic response. So the typical uh, FNUS GLM looks like this. Um, we have uh, our long separation and our short separation channels. The FNUS signal is being modeled uh, with uh, HRF regressors that can be uh, a canonical um, HRF function, it can be a Gaussian's. Um, usually there's a polynomial drift and uh, we need the stimulus. So this is why it's supervised. We need the timings of each stimulus uh, after which we expect to see an uh, HRF. And uh, the GLM then in a least square solution typically uh, gives us um, a, the best estimate for, uh, for the HRF. However, um, the physiological noise is here only modeled by short separation channels. And now we know those channels, they can actually uh, show delayed signals. And so those delays uh, can create problems or make it less optimal. But also there's other signals that might carry information like the accelerometer that we want to incorporate. So, um, well, this is what I just said. This is how, um, this is how the uh, FNU signal in the end is modeled as a um, functional response physiological drift um, and uh, well, I think the design matrix, excuse me, I'm going to skip, but this is how the design matrix looks. It's, just, it's describing the experiment basically and everything that we use as a regressor. Um, so the physiological noise is usually uh, modeled as short separation, as a, as a linear mixture of short separation channels. Now in this new approach, um, uh, we also, this is also, this is the, sorry, this is the, the Gaussians uh, that, or, the, or any other kind of regressor used for the HRF estimate. Um, in our uh, new approach now, we keep the whole framework the same, which also makes this very easy to adapt uh, for, for uh, other groups. Um, 
you can have your own GLM implementation. The only thing that we provide is a different set of regressors for uh, the GLM uh, solution. These different regressors, we built from everything we have. So in our study, what we used is short separation channels, but we measured blood pressure, PPG, respiration, and accelerometers. And then these, this, this plethora of information is being fed into our TCCA um, um, uh, routine, which is doing the temporal embedding uh, and finding the, those components um, in, this is the TCCA uh, decomposition, finding those components that correlate best between our physiological signals and the nearest signals. We do this using resting state data, so to make sure we don't overfit, to make sure we don't fit any uh, stimul stimulus in the data. Um, and what we get then is uh, a set of regressors that has a very high correlation in CCA space with all the FNIS uh, channels in CCA space. And those regressors we just use instead of the short separation regressors to do our GLM solution. Um, so the physiological nuisance is now just modeled by a linear mixture of our nuisance regressors from the TCCA instead of the short separation channels. And that is basically in the end the only difference. Now um, I want to show briefly some, some results of this um, uh, method when it's applied in a proper evaluation framework. We did um, evaluation on ground truth data using resting state data plus synthetic HRFs, but we also had visual simulation checkerboards I don't want to go into too much detail here. Uh, I just want to briefly show you a typical example here uh, when we do GLM with short separation and GLM with uh, CCA or TCCA, looking at um, root mean square error correlation F score as, as our metrics for performance. This is just one typical result. Um, and uh, this is just a typical example for you know, F score, basically depicting the F score, how many true positive, false positives, et cetera, do we have. One of the uh, subsets in the, um, in the results, because there were a lot of investigations here, is for a typical HRF amplitude. Um, uh, this shows the performance results for a, um, I'm going to go back in a second, but for a, uh, a medium contrast to noise ratio that we modeled. And um, what we see here is just, this is scatter plots simply showing, you know, average correlation RMSE F score for HBO and HBR for both methods using the same data, but a different processing. Um, and we can see that we improve across the bench, we improve the performance uh, by reducing root mean square error, improving correlation, improving F-score um, um, across the bench. This is uh, just the frequency uh, domain of the physiological noise floor um, uh, with what, gets, what comes out basically of the GLM when we use short separation in CCA. And we can see that even the short separation, there's still cardiac and respiration um, sometimes left over and uh, in CCA in the TCCA approach, this was very often much, much more reduced. So as a summary of this partial result, as this is the medium CNR, we did this also for, you know, very strong amplitudes and very, very small HRF amplitudes. Uh, we improved the correlation by more than 45% uh, and re reduced the root mean square by more than 55% and improved the F score by more than 3.05 fold. Last, but not least, um, the question is, can we always measure blood pressure, respiration, PPG, and all that? Um, probably not. Um, but also the question is, do we actually have to? And so what this investigation did is, if we assume we use everything, then we get the optimal result. What if we only use one of the modalities or a combination of two of these modalities? How much does our root mean square error improve or, uh, sorry, reduce um, or increase? Sorry, in this case, how much worse do we get? How much um, less, uh, how, how smaller, how much smaller get, uh, gets our correlation. And so what we did is just we checked all these these combinations and reran the whole analysis to see if you only put the accelerometer, for example, uh, you have accelerometer but no short separation. Well, it doesn't help so much, right? Short, short, short separation by itself does the best job. Interestingly, though, and that is also the current standard, so we're very happy that that's the case. But if you combine short separation and accelerometer, you actually get very close to the optimal um, results uh, that you that you can get if you have everything. So the um, insight here is just that um, when we can, we should use short separation and accelerometer data in our TCCA approach to uh, get very close to the optimal solution, at least you know in terms of what modalities to put into this whole pipeline. If you're interested in learning more about this, this uh, is a paper that came out just this year, in the beginning of this year, NeuroImage, and this is where we describe all that um, methodology and method itself. 
The method is also now implemented and available in Homer 3. And I'm, I'm pointing again back to this webinar that Merriam did. Merriam Mutual uh, presented this, uh, you know, did a demo of how to use this in Homer 3. Um, what you see here is a typical configuration um, that, uh, that will show you all the parameters that you have to or you can set um, for our method. And all those parameters are explained um, and evaluated in the, uh, in the paper. There's a documentation that is also, um, it, this documentation is in the, when, so if you, uh, if you clone Homer 3 from GitHub um, and you look for, uh, you know, the TCCA folder in the, in the user functions, you get a documentation as well that is also telling you a bit more of uh, what to take care of, what's the dangers that, uh, that you have to look out for. Because since this is machine learning and since there are several parameters, you can overfit, you can make your data, you can make your analysis uh, um, let's say less robust if you're not careful, um, but we try to you know make this as clear as possible and um, and provide a um, default value for each parameter that that basically on average provides the best solution. So now this is where um, after a lot of input uh, on the signal processing side, I would like to uh, move forward to our live demo. Um, as you might. Uh, I remember from the introduction, I used Gauss and said it would be nice to watch uh, Gauss, uh, like look into Gauss's brain while he's taking a stroll in the park. What we actually intended to do was uh, to show you guys a live demo in the park. Um, uh, and we did a, a very nice run that uh, that also worked very well. Um, but now the weather is really bad. So outside it's raining. Um, so this is from our test run. And what we'll do now is we'll basically do the same demo, but inside, <laughs> unfortunately. So it's no park, but it's still a live demo and it's still um, it's still going to be mobile, um, just the background's not going to be as nice. And uh, so the uh, group will now, the team will now present to you, um, I mean this is just a small video here I want to show, will present to you the system that uh, that is being used for this, the current flagship product from Nirex, which is the Nirex 4.2, um, and uh, how they can use it to create a high density setup, um, and yet um, do mobile measurements uh, in which the person can walk around and you still uh, get quite a good signal quality. So now I'm very happy to hand over and I will now uh, have to do some logistics here. I will change and um, switch to uh, Made to present us next. So we're going to switch live now. Let's see how well this works um, to see um, what the group is doing there so we can get the demo. Okay. Hi, Mario. Hello, that Alex. Hi. Yeah, good. So <laughs> we are live. Uh, okay. So I will uh, I will guide you through a demo that we're gonna do now. Uh, like Alex said, it should be on the park, but due to the weird weather now in Berlin, we decided to do inside. Uh, so what I wanted to show you, of course, we have a live demo here with the whole head solution. So we are using two. Here's part two that you already know. So two of these devices, uh, which Miren can also show there. So in our mobility pack, uh, the devices are daisy chains. So you can use a chain them uh, using these extension cables. So they are daisy chain there. And this uh, let us have 32 sources and 32 detectors, right? And uh, an important thing that we have in this uh, case here is the sampling rate. So we were able to have a, a bit more than 10 hertz sampling rate, which, which helps a lot, especially now uh, to show some, some of the movements. Uh, we're going to switch to Mahipal. I'm going to turn off here my camera so you can see him better. OK, I guess, yeah. So we are seeing Mahipal, and he's going to put on the cap. So as you can see, Mahipal is a, is a difficult subject for FNIRS, his dark hair subject and uh, thick hair and a little bit brownish uh, skin. As you know, the, the light absorbs a little bit of the light and you don't have uh, as much light going in. That's important to have a really good uh, source solution, a really good um, way to get the light in. So it's, as you can see now, he's setting up, he set up himself. Uh, one important thing also, Milan, that you can show uh, beside him, it's the cable management. So this is also very important for, for uh, mobile um, studies, right? As, as um, Alex was saying, sometimes the, the cabling and everything, this can also bring some noise to your, to your data. So it's very important that you have a 
good cable management. And yeah, so I am just, you can see my hippo there, good. I will turn on my screen again. Can you see my screen, Alex? Yes, we see your screen. We see our oh. operation routine running. Good, exactly. So this is just um, a routine that we have here just to see if the data is good before we start uh, acquiring data, of course. Um, most of our data is really good. You have a lot of green channels, some of yellow one would still acceptable. So we're, we're gonna move on just to show the how quick the setup is. Uh, let's gonna stream some data to you guys. I'm gonna start here. Let's start, I will just put his name so we can get this later, uh, this data later if we want and start the experiment. Good, okay, so now we start, let me show you here first. So as you can see, all of the channels look really, really good, really nice. You can see a nice heart rate in all of the channels. Of course, here we have more than around a hundred channels. So we're gonna switch to the line plot where we can see individual channels, which is a, a bit better to see each one. Um, okay, Mahipal, uh, you can do some, you can do some yeah. slight movements. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah. I just, sorry for interrupting yes. you. Yeah, I, I would yes, like to do exactly that. My pal moves a bit. We can see also what I basically talked about before, right? Um, what you will notice is, um, I hope in most cases, you won't really see any abrupt uh, opto shifts, but what you do see are slow changes in the FNR signal that in this case will be due to, you know, blood pressure changes, blood pooling in the head. Um, and basically in the end, yeah, changes of the position of the body. Um, and those things of course need to be tackled, but that is something we just talked about. Yeah, one thing I, I that's, uh, thank you, Alex, for complimenting that. One thing I forgot to, to tell you guys that we have two accelerometers actually in this cap. So something that's very important, what, what Alex was just telling us. So we have the accelerometer there in the cap, as you can see. Uh, and I, and here we can calibrate the accelerometer, right? So this is uh, what we what we can show. Um, this is one of the accelerometers. Mahipal, you can, yes, thank you very much. So Mahipal is moving, as you can see, uh, when he moves to one on the other, this is already streaming data from the, the accelerometer. Perfect. Thank you, okay. So now that we have the accelerometer, accelerometer set up, uh, we have really good signal. We can show a little bit more of the movements. Um, so we're just going to show a little bit of walking. I can also show you here the accelerometer. So you can see that he's walking, so no problems with the data. Accelerometer also, it's catching this um, turns that he's doing. So you can use this in your data afterwards. So you know when he turned all of this. You can check back here and check see if the data looks quite good. And look again at the whole data. Um, yeah. So Alex, uh, is there any, any movement you think it will be nice for him to do? He do? He's doing some good. So here you can see also what Alex said again about the blood pressure changes. Yeah, I, I uh, exactly. So it's really nice, uh, Maripal doing some squats. I guess this is, you know, where things get challenging if you want to do brain imaging while somebody does sports, it's probably the toughest. <laughs> but um, but I, I really like to see that um, there is uh, there is a clear heartbeat. We don't really have, uh, you know, big sudden shifts. We have this problem that we, that we know we have to tackle. And that is really what goes on in the physio physiology that is going to be a a superposition of uh, of a variety of processes, including the brain response. Exactly. So, um, so yeah, good. Now you can exactly see what what uh, Alex was saying. Just saying changes in the physiology, but no real um, decoupling from the head, right, Alex? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So um, yeah, I mean, also I guess what. <laughs> Mahipal does. So Mahipal likes I, to go crazy a little bit. <laughs> So here we can see some of the some of the the signal and also some of the yeah, yeah. here you can really yeah. see the physiological changes. We have a, an auto scale on, I guess, and that is probably why uh, you yes. the, the amplitude is dominated by the blood pressure changes. But um, yeah, there's a heartbeat on top of that. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, you can see when he stops, 
you can clearly see the heartbeat again. <laughs> cool. Good. Yeah, um, I think actually uh, that is already showing everything. Um, maybe we briefly go back to the, oh, okay, <laughs> jumping jobs. Um, briefly back to the system, just because we skipped this uh, in the transition, um, um, just to briefly say something about what, what, what he has on his back. I think we had this one slide that I showed very quickly, only uh, one system yeah. has 16 by 16 detectors and emitters. Yeah, yeah. Sure, let me show the slide again. So this is just uh, uh, what uh, Alex uh, showed and I showed you also. So we have here the 16 sources, 16 detectors. So two nearest part two, Milan is showing it again. Uh, as you can see, it's wireless. So uh, he's completely free. I'm, I'm here in another point, just acquiring data. We are also connected to, a, to an access point so he can move freely. We can get a really nice range. Uh, we have a 24-bit resolution for this, these amplifiers, and yeah, we can uh, also adjust uh, individual brightness of the of the sources. And yeah, and the, we and one thing that is also important for this case, and I'm sure you already saw in, in, in Mahipal's head, maybe Milan can show you. We have different uh, strengths for each spring. So if when the when the participant has more hair or things where it's a bit more difficult to get, you can change the spring uh, strength and this will help also with the with the data quality as you saw he just put on the cap and and the data quality was was already good enough for uh, for one experiment as you can see here he can do some movements like this kind of movement that doesn't really change a lot the blood pressure it's it's still good no problems uh, no physiological changes there so that's good very cool yeah is cool. there anything else you would like to to see uh alex or is something else that uh we should yeah, i think track? i think we actually covered it all i mean what you can do my apologies, is really show the typical opto shift that we didn't see and luckily we didn't see and we don't want to see them but okay. <laughs> if you know you know move the cap a bit uh how that differs yeah, yeah, from sure um, uh, from yeah yeah he, he's not uh listening to you so i will tell him what oh. what you <laughs> Uh, Mahipa, what we want to see that we didn't see for uh, that was good. Just shift the cap a little bit so we can see what what a, a, an artifact of decoupling. So that's 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 there, yeah. exactly. So this how it's how a, a motion artifact from the decoupling would would look like, right? Exactly. And so this is something that mostly has to be solved mechanically, which I mean, Nurex did with with the springs and this the setup that we see um and uh if, sure. if this is basically dominating the signal then there i if it continues to dominate you know you can of course interpolate and, and cut out um pieces of trials but if it generally dominates in a motion uh, you know in a mobile experiment then well the data will be more or less useful uh, useless so uh, i think this is generally one of the reasons also to point out why it is good to have fiberless systems and why most of the current systems now the newer systems are all fiberless because um, they are lightweight and they they avoid a lot of these problems Great. okay um, I think then for now I will just um, take back control thank you very much for this perfect demo. thank you thank you very much let us know if you need yeah. anything else uh, we, we did have a quick question actually Alex okay. and Mike. Just to confirm, okay. that's actually a 32 source 32 detector system that was being used because the 1616, you were just referring to the individual amplifiers and there are two amplifiers. Yes, okay. sorry, yes. Uh, yeah, we, so the two devices were daisy chain and then we have 32 sources and 32 detectors. So what we call the standard hold head uh, solution. Thanks so much. Perfect, thanks. Thank you. Okay, so then um, I hope everybody now sees my screen again, we, we are back in the structure of this talk. What we want to do now is uh, we, we hear uh, Robert Franke, Dr. Robert Franke, our team lead of the software department here at New York, talk a bit about the accelerometer um, that is built in and you know what it can do and what the, what the data you know, rate and so on looks like. So I will now uh, shift over to him and make him the presenter here. Um, Robert, be ready. This should be you now. Thank you, Alex, and thanks for the great uh, live demo, Mari. That was really impressive. So I have the privilege to talk a bit about one tiny technical detail, namely the accelerometer support in our NOSPOR2 device. 
I'm going to uh, first go over the hardware a bit um, and then tell you how you can get the data and, and how it's stored and how we're running. Use. So hardware specification wise, we use very high quality six axis uh, inertial measurement units from Bosch, the BMI 160, coupled with a magnetometer sensor, the BMM 150, which is a three axis magnetometer. We are not yet using the magnetometer to its full extent because that would require an on-site uh, calibration procedure, which we um, have not yet perfected, but um, stay tuned for the future. Um, yeah, as I said, so six axis IMU, that means three linear acceleration axis and three gyroscope axis, so you can um, measure um, accelerations in, in all uh, spatial dimensions. We sample at 100 hertz, which is enough for, you know, like normal physiological movements. The um, resolution is 16 bit for the linear accelerations in a range of plus minus 2G, which is also um, okay for, for most physiological movements. The angular rate can go up to 2000 degrees per second, so you can spin your head really fast or you can put a participant in a spinning chair if you want to. Also there for the angular rate, the resolution is 16 degrees. Um, what's important to know is that you can fit the accelerometer that you can see on the right hand side into the standard optical positions in the cup, so you could freely decide where to put it depending on what kinds of movements um, you want to measure. You could, of course, also decide to put it somewhere else on the body. For example, um, if you have two accelerometers, um, you can put one on the head and one on the arm to measure participants' uh, arm position, for example. You can have two of these um, devices per nurse spot two device. So if you have this tandem setup that Mari just showed and that was just demoed, you could actually use four accelerometers. So you could measure your participants' movement in quite a lot of detail in different body parts. Um, in a hyperscanning setup, you can have two or more subjects and you can acquire data from each of them with sufficient um, granularity. What can we do with the data in Aurora? So the data is streamed to Aurora with a full 100 hertz, both in USB and Wi-Fi mode. And this data um, would also be stored on the device. So if either you're in a standalone mode or in very um, challenging circumstances, if you lose the Wi-Fi connection, all the accelerometer data, accelerometer data is also stored on the device, so it's not lost. And then on the Aurora side, we currently use it to do this position estimation um, or orientation estimation that uh, was seen in the live demo. We use a sense of fusion algorithm for that so-called matrix fusion, um, which currently, as I said before, ignores the magnetic field values as they are very dependent on the environment and can also be easily, um, you know, can throw your algorithm off track in a challenging environment. If you have an MRI nearby, for example, that would not work very well. Um, this position estimation is, of course, only useful for the head, um, as, as you see in the visualization. So that's why also this calibration procedure, it does not alter your data in any way. The data is stored in, in raw form on this. Um, it's only used for calibration, uh, for, for visualization. So if you want to either skip that uh, step or you make a slight mistake in your uh, this calibration procedure to show the right head orientation, please be assured the data is not affected in any way. Once you finish your experiment, what can you do with the data? Um, right now, we um, have limited or let's say first step support for writing this data into the NERS and SNR formats. And that is mostly because uh, the .NERS format is quite limited in what it can store in auxiliary data. So currently we only store for each frame of our um, measurement um, the highest acceleration and the highest rotation velocity. That is good for artifact detection, but if you wanted to, for example, run an offline orientation estimate of the participant, that would not be enough. So it, it, it can be used as a regressor to regress out um, in, in similar ways as Alex just explained, to regress out um, physiological components but it's not enough for orientation estimation. But we store the full raw data in the zip file in the output folder, and there's an .acc file for accelerometer inside, which stores the full raw data. 
we are working on making this data format more accessible for, for users. In right now, it's not the easiest um, to, accessible, to access data. This also brings me to the outlook. So in the future, there's now this uh, common SNP file format, which is much more versatile, much more flexible for storing auxiliary data. So we will bring the full 100 hertz of accelerometer measurements to this file format so you can really use it in your analysis. And we will also bring LSL streaming of our acceler acceleration and gyroscope um, values. So you can, during the, um, during the measurement, you can either use your own visualization, you can use it for live regression using some, some other software um, and so on. We are thinking about uh, simple online motion artifacts detection, also nicer visualizations of the accelerometer values. So basically the line plots that Alex showed, which uh, show the, for example, the magnitude of the acceleration, which is also more useful if you put the accelerometers somewhere else than just the hat. That's it for me. That's the accelerometer in the nurse world too. And that, uh, let me give it back to Alex, who will tell us about his vision. Thanks, Robert. Very nice. I'm, I'm sure there will be questions, uh, so we might hear from you again. Um, I will now show my screen again. Um, do you all see this? I assume yes. Um, so yeah, then this is basically, we're nearly at the end of, uh, of this webinar already. Um, the last slides and then comes the Q&A. Uh, I wanted to take just to briefly introduce you to the vision that we developed at uh, the Neurophotonics Center at BU in the, uh, in the past years when I was still there. And now that lab is still continuing that, but I think this vision is basically bigger, right? It's uh, um, something that hopefully the whole community, uh, the Ethnos research community will, will support in one way or another and extend. Um, it is called simply neuroscience in the everyday world. And uh, in this specific you know, vision uh, and, and, and kind of, let's say implementation, um, the idea is that there will be high density and high uh, high density FNUs and high density EEG um, integrated into one system or into a, a, a couple of systems that are both uh, combined so that data is synchronized very uh, very well and uh, that are lightweight enough and wearable enough so that a participant can move around freely, like we also saw in the demo. Now to cover uh, the, the ideas now to um, combine this this uh, hybrid. Um, high density system or any high density system with um, eye tracking glasses. Um, it, it doesn't have to be Toby, but Toby was at the time uh, a very good good example of you know what what was possible to combine it with eye tracking glasses and to uh, not only simultaneously acquire uh, all the physiological signals that we're interested in, but also um, to acquire uh, the video stream of what the person is seeing and combine it with uh, the eye tracking. Uh, that the Toby glasses or any other eye tracking glasses provide. The idea here is now that if we now we live in a decade um, of machine learning and computer vision and and uh, strong con constantly growing AI power, the idea is that uh, there is already services out there that you can use to um, constantly and continuously. Um, uh, detect objects in a video feed or you know in a, in a single picture to um, to do object and recognition um, constantly um, usually those those uh, systems or those solutions offer a kind of probability output of what is being detected um, and so doing this combining these features in a out of lab scenario in this vision um, would then allow us to automatically generate um, a regressor onset times so in this example here, what you see is uh, it's just a very con well controlled um, condition on some some car park without cars, and um, as soon as a certain object is recognized, and this for in this case to simplify this, for example, could be a QR code that stands for pillar, for example. Um, as soon as uh, eye tracking and recognition of this object overlap with a certain probability, um, you can use this to automatically annotate the data um, and to automatically generate uh, markers or stimulus timings into the uh, to use in, with the syn synchronized data. And this then, uh, you know, you, you've seen this before now, this is the GLM with TCCA, it could of course be inserted in any other kind of analysis um, pipeline as well, but in this vision, um, we we said okay, these stimuli onsets 
um, we, we generate on the fly from the data. Also later you have a kind of searchable um, uh, data stream in which you, you can combine conditions uh, and you can say if uh, the, uh, the person was looking for longer than a certain amount of time at an object that was detected with a certain confidence as the object that we're interested in could be another face um, or you know, could be a car, then uh, create the stimulus. And this can be, of course, automized and, and, and um, will in the future hopefully uh, improve greatly uh, our ability to also label the data um, that will not be as simple and, uh, and well controlled anymore as a regular experimental setup in the lab. So um, with that, um, vision from Boston that is currently, I think, moved forward there. Um, I uh, would like to conclude my presentation and I'm uh, gonna hand off back to uh, the organizers here and we'll, we'll start our Q&A session for whatever uh, questions came up in the meantime. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Alex. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, really enjoyed your talk. Thank you, Robert. Uh, also, Made, Milan, Mahi, Paul for that excellent demo. We have been getting some good questions already. And please, if you were holding on to any questions uh, and thinking about wanting to ask something, now is definitely the time to do that. Go to the GoToMeeting or GoToWebinar, pardon me, panel, uh, type them in. We will see them and hopefully be able to get to those. Uh, we, we likely won't be able to get to everything because we've already gotten a lot of questions. So please understand we will reach out to you and make sure that your questions get answered. Again, you can email us at consulting at nearx.net. Uh, furthermore, I wanted to mention that we have other webinars coming up uh, very shortly. Uh, there's one that's a follow-up on Lab Streaming Layer with David Medine uh, that's going to be coming up this month, as well as uh, uh, one on cognitive load in surgeons. So uh, let's first get to the first question. Can you also imitate some verbal responses uh, in the demonstration? This is also related to the chin strap, is it not? And I'm happy to uh, address this related to actually a point that we had last week in our webinar with uh, toddlers, with Susan Perlman. Um, first of all, we actually offer a, ch a chest strap in addition to the chin strap. Uh, and and th it's exactly for this particular need that uh, that eliminates that uh, potential stretch on the cap. If there is uh, that though, uh, we certainly are happy to do a little demonstration if anyone wants to particularly see that one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. We're not going to do another demo right now because we're just focusing on the Q&A session. Um, but in more detail, certainly there is a limit to how much anyone could pull on a cap anywhere uh, where you will start to get some decoupling uh, effects. But in that sense, the best thing that you can see is really just seeing it live and at what point uh, is the jaw extended where you see uh, noise in the Usually it's the most lateral channels closest to the jaw, of course, that you can see that. Alex, I don't know if you yeah. wanted to add more than that. Uh, yeah, I want to, I mean, actually, I want to apologize because this is a point that I forgot. I would have liked to ask my Paul to speak more than he actually did already. I don't know if you guys noticed, I mean, he was talking in between. I'm not sure if we showed the, the, the live data in the meantime, but what we did in our tests before, uh, and that was also new to me since I'm kind of new to, to Narex, um, it is actually interesting how much Mayapal can or could have talked um, or, and did talk um, without you seeing a, uh, a big motion uh, artifact in the cap. Certainly that's limited, as you said, Thomas, um, but I, actually I personally, I was a bit surprised how little you see it if he was talking normally, you know, without doing very big stretches. Yes, and I did get a note actually from uh, the organizers here that we're working with that he, he was talking during the demo, but you have to take my word for that because of course we can hear him and, and see that and, and we're happy to uh, not just take my word for it. As mentioned, please reach out, uh, you know, the, the person that asked that question, we'll make sure we, we uh, offer you a demo if you'd like to see that uh, for yourself. Anyway, moving on, uh, how many short channels do we need to have in our setup? Is one enough? Do we need to cover the whole regions of interest that we're interested in? That is that is certainly, um, I would say, a very up-to-date topic. It's a very great question, and um, I don't think that it is um, it is answered in a conclusion con conclusive way. But certainly, um, the one paper that I just mentioned, um, and it's in the slides uh, that that the ETH group just brought out, would argue, I think, that one is not enough. I would also argue that one short separation channel is not enough. 
Um, now there's many reasons for that that you can kind of bring up. Um, first of all, just from going back to what I presented here, uh, we couldn't see this in my data, but you can see it in any FNIST data that you that you measure, you know, and then look into um, the channels, the FNIST channels that are distributed over the head they do show de delays between uh, each other, right? And that is just to, just to the vasculature the vasculature um, in the head. Um, so uh, you uh, you will always, for short and for long separation channels, see different uh, signals. Just talking about the systemic physiology, of course, we hope to, <laughs> to see uh, different brain regions light up. But uh, just talking of the systemic physiology, you will always have um, different amplitudes, but also different phases. And so um, ways to tackle this in, in the methods that I proposed um, was to, uh, to temporarily embed those um, temporarily em embed those signals so you, you can kind of capture those, so those delays. Um, but that, that alone, I would say, is not sufficient. So I would say, uh, it, you know, this is a matter of how, how good can you get. Um, what you want is the most optimal physiological nuisance regressor. And uh, to get that, in my opinion right now, my humble opinion, I would say you should try to get um, a, a well-distributed number of short separation channels. Um, the number certainly can be argued about, but uh, um, I think, oh, Thomas, correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, I think in the NeurIX solution there currently is, uh, you know, if you get a short separation solution, you have eight channels uh, that come with it, by, and then you have to sacrifice basically only one detector. Um, those eight are certainly a good number to start with. Um, more is always better, <laughs> but um, uh, if, you, if you use a, a certain number of short separation channels and you include, you know, phase shifts, um, then I think you're on a pretty good, good side to start. Yes, uh, excellent answer. I'll, I'll add to uh, that also that uh, Ted Huppert's paper that came out just a couple weeks ago, it's Santosa et al. called Quantitative Comparison of Correction Techniques uh, for Removing Systematic Physiological Signal and Functional Neuroinfrared Spectroscopy Studies, did use eight short channels and showed improvement uh, through eight, through all eight. So they suggested that it could certainly be more than that needed for, I believe they had a, an eight source, eight detector set up, so it wasn't even a whole head. So even just for that, uh, those, those patches, uh, they, they did show improvement in the analysis and it's definitely worth a read. Next question. The Nearsport 2 is an all LED setup, but don't fiber optics get better data quality? Can you still do uh, a mobile fiber optic setup? Um, I'm happy to help, or if you want to go take that one. Yeah, I mean, I can give a first first answer, and then maybe uh, just in a very general sense, regardless of the near sport or, or uh, the the solution here, um, it is. I think it's important to differentiate between the 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 emitter type and the material uh, used to couple the light that comes from this emitter to the scalp. So if you use LEDs, you can actually place them on the head, and you can basically skip the fiber optics. If you use lasers, you usually can't. Um, so I assume that in this question, behind that question is actually, um, if you use lasers, which typically, not always, but typically use fiber optics, don't you get a better uh, signal? And I think by now I would say that is actually, um, uh, the, the, the advantages of lasers are um, not as clear anymore as they might have been. So LEDs have been used for a while now and uh, have shown to be seem like sufficient. Um, they have a, a wider um, frequency range, so they have not a single peak, but in terms of, um, of the, since, um, the, the accuracy that you can achieve with all the other assumptions in the modified bell lambert law, et cetera, it seems that this is not a problem. Um, in general, that is my last statement here, I would actually say that um, when you can, especially in a mobile setup, when you can avoid fibers, um, you're always better off. In general, fibers, um, regardless of the emitter and the detector technology, if you couple in fibers in between, you always lose some light. Um, and that is something else. It might still be way better if there's a detector that is super sensitive, but in general, fibers um, potentially le uh, lead to loss of signal. Um, and that might be very small, but that means if you can skip them, then you don't lose that part, that fraction of the signal as well. I would, a very good answer. I'll add to that just a little bit that uh, the weight also tends to be greater in, in fibers um, a consideration of course you have more more glass in there um, and there is subjectivity it depends we could definitely say it depends on what system you're considering and so you want to dig in deep no matter what system you ever consider because it could be the case that you have a very lightweight 
very thin fiber optic probe, but then that has its trade-offs in terms of less light passing through the, the, the fiber versus you could potentially have a heavier uh, a heavier uh, active probe as well. It really depends and, and get the details on whatever you're going to you know, end up wanting to use for your work and, and see how that's going to fit in uh, with answering your research questions. Um, but you, had, you gave a great, great answer there and we can move on to our next question. There appeared to be many channels in the recording. Can you comment on the setup in further detail? And I, I have gotten some information on that. It was, uh, again, 32 sources, 32 detectors with two near sport, two amplifiers uh, chained together. Uh, you can go all the way to actually five near sport, two amplifiers. So that would be 80 sources and 80 detectors uh, on simultaneous recording on a single subject. These are integrated so that all timing is synchronized between the system clocks perfectly. So you can have sources from one system uh, being read by detectors from another system, and of course, back and forth with sources and detectors from each system. This was 105 data channels. Um, did use two accelerometers. The near sport system allows for uh, one accelerometer, uh, excuse me, two accelerometers per amplifier. So we could have even had two more if we wanted to. Uh, not necessary right now, similar to the how many short channels we need. Um, we're really trying to have that capacity for as many as you might want. If you wanted to have more and more accelerometers, you can add in a lot there. Um, besides that, it did use our mobile pack. So the, the pack that we saw was something that NIREX is providing. And we also offer a, a hip pack if you didn't want to wear it on the back. Um, Yes, besides that, uh, 162 hertz maximum sampling rate. The actual sampling rate was not quite that. I don't know exactly what it was, but likely it's going to be 10 to 20 hertz, most likely. I think it was 10.5 or something, just a bit over 10. 10. Got it. Um, yeah. And I'll let uh, 10.2 was what I got. <laughs> 10.2 is coming in. So. If there's any other key features that I might have missed, um, we can certainly come back to that. Next question. Is it possible to use the GLM plus the TCCA method that you talked about, including short channels and accelerometer data for real-time applications such as BCI? Yes, um, certainly. Um, it's not trivial <laughs> because um, but it's definitely doable. And uh, so the answer is based on what, what you use to, to do the real-time modeling of the GLM, right? The GLM is a supervised and, and offline method. It, it looks at the whole data and, uh, and does the regression based on the whole data. And so that obviously won't work for, for, um, for real-time. But uh, the, the GLM can be modeled in, uh, in uh, online um, solutions, for example, in the Kalman filter approach. So you can say, the, um, the GLM um, coefficients that we actually want to estimate, those parameters can be um, consistently basically uh, re-estimated based on every all, all the data that came in in the past. Um, that is one way of doing this. Um, and uh, I think actually now this is, to be honest, really something I don't really know. I understood, Thomas, that um, there's Turbo Sartorio, so that is not doing um, the TCCA uh, approach so far, but uh, a, a real-time solution that um, that might do real-time GLM already. So I just please give some input there. I'm not yet uh, aware of enough. I am uh, not uh, exactly clear on that either, and I apologize. I was just uh, asking for clarification on the next question also. So uh, sorry for for questioning you off guard. Then so I think in the yeah. in the um, in the summary here, yes, it is possible. Um, you will have to do quite some algorithmic development, um, but it is definitely possible, and especially if you have somebody who knows Wiener filtering, Kalman filtering, all those kind of online filters very well, then uh, then you can definitely implement this. In the end, um, on the TCCA side, yes, you can generate, TC uh, generate TCCA regressors on the fly. So uh, just, just to briefly reiterate how this works, um, TCCA is um, based on machine learning in the sense that the filters, the statistical properties, so the filters that you learn, the TCCA filters, are, um, are based on the statistical properties of the data. And that uh, is in a training session that will always have to include some offline data, like all the other real-time applications that use some filters. Um, so if you acquire some resting, data, uh, resting state data and you do the training of these filters, then afterwards, 
uh, on the TCCIA side to generate those regressors um, that, that we found. This is a mere matrix multiplication. So um, that is super easy to do on online and in real time. The only problem then is uh, the online uh, regression. <laughs> so you have the regressors then. How do you do, do the regression in a GLM approach, for example? That is something that is, for example, a common approach. Great. Uh, I did get a, a uh, answer there that Turbo Satori does not currently have TCCA, but it does use GLM online filtering. There are a lot of other features. We have some videos already available there. Uh, it does even have online short separation uh, removal, heart, uh, heart, uh, heartbeat detection as part of its signal quality uh, uh, indicator. Um, so there are a lot of really, really great features there. Now, um, so here we've got some update here. Um, so instead of having uh, optical fibers and wired sensors, that is a connection between a head cap and an amplifier. Is it possible to have a fully wireless connection between just the probes themselves and an amplifier? Um, I can speak to that from, from my knowledge first, but of course you're, you're the uh, electrical and biomedical engineer. So I, I can say that uh, uh, we do have an amplifier that is, you know, I also happen to have one here, um, right here that we do have it sitting on the back or the hip. And the reason that we have this amplifier of this size is it has, the goal is to have uh, the, the best possible signal quality achievable in f nears in as small of a form factor as possible while also maintaining a lot of other flexible options. Um, so with, with all of those requirements, that was the smallest that we could, that could possibly be achieved. And um, that being said, if you're really gonna limit what you might want to do, uh, you, we already saw an example, Alex, of, of your work where you had the entire thing that was just 4.2 centimeters, you know, square, roughly, right? That was a full amplifier and probes and everything. Yeah. Um, so if you want to expand on that, I mean, it, it again kind of depends on what you want to do with your f near signal and your what what your research is, what your questions are, and then what uh, with that, what what equipment would you require? What kind of signal quality and multimodal data, things like that. Yeah, uh, yeah good point. So um, the M3BA that I presented briefly, um, yes, right, it, it all includes that you can integrate it in the cap, there's no wires. Um, uh, but, <laughs> I mean, basically the, the motivation of this, whole, of this whole architecture was in the end to enable custom customized setup in in a more as in a less in a research setting i mean we used it in a research setting but it was more towards um the you know customized instrumentation almost so the point here what we built right this headset that i built with two m3ba sensors for the workload experiment was basically a headset that you would use for a workload experiment um just also because everything was fixed and where it was placed and so um while the m3bas um enable that uh they are not a product, but you know, while while certainly Thomas, you're right. You can you can um, if you have a very specific application, you can certainly downsize and and optimize. Um, then it, it just also limits what you can do with the device in the in the research you want to do. And um, the other thing is just that the M3BAs are clearly designed for a um, a lower channel count. It was scalable, so you can get quite some channels still. But it, the architecture would never allow. Um, uh, something like a whole head high density uh, measurement. So this is, I think, the trade-off between, let's say, a high-performance instrument that is maximally flexible and uh, and a custom-tailored solution that, in this example, in this experiment, was exactly what we needed. Um, but that would also kind of need to redesign for the next experiment you want to do. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much for expanding on that. And we have just one last question. How is the sampling frequency currently affected when combining two systems, I suppose, or more? Uh, and how does this frequency further depend on the probe setup? That is, is crosstalk still an issue in very high density setups? I'm happy to start with that. Uh, this is a subjective question to the Murex Near Sport 2 system that we just saw. It, it is affected by, uh, um, well, first and foremost, it is a fully frequency encoded system. You have that option to fire all sources simultaneously. And uh, at that rate, uh, we do have a pretty high maximum sampling rate, but I, I believe the, the sampling rate is in the, the tens of hertz, something like 80 hertz maximum for, for, for all sources firing simultaneously. When we multiplex the sources firing at different times, 
uh, then we are indeed uh, reducing the sampling rate as we go up in source count. There is no crosstalk issue uh, if we do a multiplex sequence where we never have two sources firing at the same time. That goes back to what I had mentioned earlier where we have full integration between the system's timing. So we had a little cable at the bottom uh, between the systems that you might have seen in the demo. And so you don't have any crosstalk issue, talk issues in those instances. We do have the option, however, to have sources firing simultaneously if you wanted to intentionally do that to increase your sampling rate. Um, more or less, we see sampling between 10 to 20 hertz uh, as we go up in, in, in uh, source count. Uh, you saw, for example, 10.2 hertz was uh, the, the sampling rate with the 3232 setup. If we went up to you know, double that to 6464, we would expect it to be around five hertz. Uh, though that's a very, very high density setup. And there are ways indeed for us to, as I mentioned, have multiple sources firing at the same time, so long as they'd be very far apart. So if I'm having a source on one side of my head and the other side of my head firing, we would not have crosstalk as an issue. That being said, we also have an indicator in our software to be uh, certain if, if there's potential crosstalk. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if there's more that you wanted to add to that. Alex? No. <laughs> okay, great. Um, with that, I'd like to close it all and thank again everyone for attending as well as uh, uh, all the people from NIRX that have done such a great job of organizing this. Really appreciate being able to be a part of it. If you do have questions, again, email consulting at nirex.net. Uh, consulting at nirex.net. You can always go to our website and just find a way to get in touch there. Thanks again. Well, thank you. Bye-bye.